Tell me what it's like being a senior man in the house. Uh, it took a while to get here. Right, right. <laughs> it took a while to get here, but uh, you know, I was brought up by a lot of good senior guys. When I came on a job, everybody was senior. So not just saying that from a rookie standpoint, but every guy had at least you know 10 years on the job. Nowadays, uh, the whole job is real young. I think we have 75% is under 60 years or eight oh, wow. years on a job, something like that. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's a big changeover, but if you were taught the right way from when I came on a job, you can pass that down to the other guys, so. And now that you're, now that you're a senior man in the house and, you, and one of your jobs, obviously, to mentor these firefighters mm -hmm. coming up, tell me what mm -hmm. that's like for you. Stressful, it could be stressful. I mean, I take a lot of pride in, in trying to teach these guys the right way. There's one way to, there's one way to do it, and that's just the right way. Right. Hands down. Absolutely. And that's the way we were taught, and, and you go from, whether it starts at the kitchen table in the morning to the chief's floor has to get mopped, that has to be done first, to when you go to a fire and you pull a line and, and the guy, you need to know that they're with you and you can teach them the right way. So One of the things I love about Jersey City is this, uh, or FDJ says, you guys talk about, there's so much tradition, so mm -hmm. much culture in this house. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, and the one thing is, you guys are no joke here. Mm -hmm. This is where you know everyone has to be 100%, 100% of the time. All the time. time. Yeah. So tell me about the firehouse kitchen. What does that mean to you? Uh, the kitchen's that that's home that I mean that's the home and it, we're, we're here what four months a year right. right if you put it all together we're here four months a year that's where everybody is you you know everything about everybody in the kitchen you guys saw it today when you're in there and, and, and you know it's whether we're joking or you know you just little nitpicking or you know what somebody picking up a pot or anything like that but you your family that's where your family and that's and that's the main part here because I want to be able to trust my we want everybody's used the word brotherhood Absolutely. hey brother we're brothers we're brothers right. But you know what? That's where it starts because if I can joke around with you, but you still have my back, you know, when we leave that office, that room, you know, we're, we're, we're good. And the, and the reality is, you're not truly a brother <clears throat> until you've been accepted by the brother. You have to be accepted. You have to be accepted. I mean, everybody wants to be called it, but right. until you're getting dirty, yeah. until you're picking up holes together when it's 10 degrees out and you're freezing mm -hmm. and your gloves are wet and you're going, I want to get out of here. Let's all do it together. Let's go. I mean, that's how you earn the respect of the senior guy. And it's and right past the dream. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I tell you, it took a long time to not feel like a new guy, probably 10, 12 years. And it, there's still times where I go, I'm working with senior guys where I go, I, I still feel like a new guy, because I am. Absolutely. These guys are all senior. So, you know, you, you know your role and you just accept it and, and you learn with it. And learn I'm learning every day. Every sure. day there's something to learn, you know? So yeah. it's, and they teach me, these young guys teach me all this new stuff. So it's, yeah. it's, it's good. The it's one good. thing that they have, we didn't have was like YouTube. All these yeah. different videos, yeah. all these different tactics, you know, yeah. all these different acronyms, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it, it's, you know, myself being the amount of time I have on too, it's interesting to, to watch these new guys coming up, right. new girls coming up. Yep. And uh, and I feel like you do. We have to mentor. Yep. I mean, that's our responsibility, mm -hmm. right? As yeah, man. Absolutely. absolutely. So what advice would you have um, for someone looking to become a firefighter? What, what is it about Jersey City that's so great for you? Ah, uh, what is it about Jersey City? Uh, I guess it's, it's the diversity, I would have to say. I mean, I grew up in this area and like we were just talking about I worked down at a couple different houses one house for nine years one house for five years and I was in a busy house for five years and we get the reset button so I wanted to growing up you want to be fine and I'd see I mean my uncle was a fine but you grow up and you see the guys pass on a truck and that's what I want to do well I worked in different parts of the city where I didn't notice it learned different parts different diversity there then you go to you know central part of the city of engine nine and it was very let's say culturally different than where sure. I grew up, sure. and which, which I know the city, and don't get me wrong, but now I'm up to where I grew up. And now I, I, I drive down the street, I see people I know that I grew up with. That I, that's you know, great. Right, and that's, yeah. that's the part where I, you know, it, it changed a little bit for me. But um, it's, it would have to be the diversity. I mean, I run into people that are chief in Hoboken, the chief of the department I'm at the high school with. Cool. You know, so it's, it's just weird that it's, it's just that no, I didn't really give you an answer. Yet, so right. no, that's, no, it's perfect. What, just, what you're saying is absolutely true, man. It, it, it is, it is. That is one great thing about Jersey City is the diversity, right? And it's such a cool place to work because it's, it's always changing. It's very dynamic here, right? And right. Um, so, what advice would you give a firefighter that wants to be a firefighter? Um, what do you say to them now, as listen, a senior man? Listen, listen, just listen. Don't come in. You can come in. There's a fine line between cocky and confident. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Very that's fine line. Point. And a lot of guys like to walk close. I, know, I did it too. Don't sure. get me wrong. But sure. you don't, when you step over that line and get to the cocky side, that's where guys step back and go, whoa, I can't teach this guy anything. I can't, I can't say a word to him. Or they're not listening to me. But if you stay on that confident line where, you know, I can do this job. I, you know, I, I'll take what you're telling me and I'll do it. Then that's fine. You stay on that line. And then my job, even as a senior man, is when these guys become senior, because at one point, either you retire, you get promoted, you change houses. 
They are the senior guys. Now. Correct. And they get new guys coming in every year. Now, you got to teach them the right way from the beginning. That's and great. That's, that's the bottom line. For me. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and it was real fun talking to you because, again, you know, the information you're giving out to these young guys and girls that are looking to be a firefighter, and not just Jersey City, bro, right. but just, just a firefighter in general, man. Yeah. As a senior man, you know, you, you are the guys we want to talk to because right. you're the ones that are, are, you know, the core of this culture. Right. You know, you're the ones doing mm -hmm. this job day in, mm -hmm. day out. And seeing what's coming in, seeing and what's going learning out. every day, learning, yeah. learning the culture, even for me, every day, every time we're here, it's something new, it's something you didn't see the first time, or you saw it once, but it's a little different on this one. Absolutely. The training we had today was a perfect example. We've never, you know, taken that much effort into just listening. Not training was sitting; most of the guys were sitting, but just listening. So that was the first time I've seen that training ever done, and I, I thought it was, I thought right. it was phenomenal training, right. you know. And I, I took a lot from it, and it wasn't even part of my drill, but. It was great to see everybody was right. working so well together. And you can use that going forward. And I absolutely will. I'm, right. gonna, I'm going to bring that drill to my house, right. as a matter of fact. So uh, that's one of the things I do in my house is right. the training. So I'm going to bring that back. Yeah. So, Thanks so much, bro. I appreciate, I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eli Ramos. I am a Jersey City fireman. I am the Tillerman Ladder 3 today. Uh, my name is Colette. I am uh, on Ladder Company 3, and I am the chauffeur today of Jersey City Fire Department. Well, I mean, it's great. Um, the only thing that's a little challenging is sometimes the streets are a little tough, uh, making turns and stuff like that, people hanging off the corners. Uh, but, I mean, navigating through the city and Learning all the different sections of the city and all of that is the best, especially this rig because you have two people. So. How long have you been a firefighter? I just started my third year. Third year? Mm -hmm. Best job in the world? It's the best job in the whole world. Do you expect this? Did you come from a firefighter family? No, I'm the first fire in my whole family. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. First, first generation firefighter. First generation firefighter. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And it's rare. A little bit. A lot of people come from firefighter families. So yes. That's, that's cool that you, you did the different route. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. What was yeah. the fire academy like for you? Uh, fire academy was tough. Uh, it was a lot of academics, and then after the academics, there was a lot of actual, you know, the firefighting, the PT, all of that. Um, the only good thing that was very structured. So somebody like myself who had no background, you really get a good understanding, but you really learn the job once you get here. You get with these guys, you get with senior men, and you just learn the job. Tell me what the firehouse kitchen means to you. It's my favorite place in the whole world. <laughs> it's my coffee. favorite place. My coffee. <laughs> in the mornings, you know, you talk to the crew, the night, the crew that was uh, coming off shift, and you really get a sense of what they had the day before, if there's anything going on with the rig, if, um, you know, anything's going on with the house. The gossip, you know, it's everything. Grand a lot Central of people I interview tell me that all the world's problems are solved with the kitchen. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you're having a tough day and yeah. you go to the kitchen, you know that someone at that kitchen is going to be there to talk to you. Oh, absolutely. You, you know what? These, I say it all the time, but these are these are the brothers that I never wanted and can never live without again. <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted you guys, but I got you. And I'm so happy I have you. Aww. Because you know what? There's been days where, you know what? You have a call. You doubt yourself, you know, or you did a good job. And you're not necessarily looking for that reinforcement, but... They taught you how to do that, so now you feel good that you're like, oh, I did it, I'm getting it, I understand it. You know, and when you get in a house like this, at least for me, and you have these guys that are just here for you unconditionally, I mean, they're gonna break, you know, they break chops and do all that stuff, but that's all part of it, but. And that's a rite of passage, anyway. Oh, mm -hmm. man. If, if they're not breaking chops, then you gotta, you gotta worry. worry. Bit, right? They're told us <laughs> oh, to yeah. Yeah, they don't talk to you, that's a problem. Yeah. Brother, tell me about Tillerman. Children's fun. I love it. I uh, I caught on pretty quick. I was a pumper, pumper guy for about. Oof, I've been here about eight years now. So pumper guy for about three of them. And this is about my fourth year on the air. So you're yeah, you're mentoring people now too, right? Yeah, I, I, I taught her to tell her. You know, the, the little bit that I knew, she 
you know, got it. And but it's uh, it's it's fun. So when did you go to Fire Academy? Wow, long ago in the galaxy. No, uh, it's 2011. I I was in there. Yeah, it was a while. So. Being a Tillerman, you guys always are switching positions? Yeah. Yeah, we rotate yeah, through. So whoever, whoever's Tillerman then moves to the middle, then chauffeur. So next door, I go and I Tiller. So great. we kind of just basically push forward. We work together. Yeah. That's great. So tell me your experiences being a Jersey Z fly fighter. It's, it's, been, it's been fun. It's been interesting. It's been thought-provoking. It's been uplifting. Um, honestly, this job... I always liked helping people, even when I was a kid. I was a kid that used to help the old lady cross the street. Um, the neighbors move and nobody else would show up. <laughs> so I always had that heart, and my brother's the same way too, and we were always that type of person. So when I got this job, I already had the heart, and I had the, you know, my mom could tell you stories, all the stuff I did on rooftops when I was younger. So I had that too, that, fearless, um, that fearlessness. So it kind of came easy, honestly, and in brute strength. She can tell you about that. <laughs> the brute strength part <laughs> on some calls. I can't say it on camera. <laughs> yeah. strength you, have. you know, but it's uh, you know, it's, it's fun. I, I enjoy it a lot. I'm I'm grateful every day I wake up and I get to go to work. I feel blessed that I have a chance to be part of something to help other people and you know, and even like you said, mentor little kids. I mean, I go to schools and talk to them fire safety. I teach, so you know, I give them a little bit of fire safety while I'm teaching art. So it's, it's all, it's all. But you also do something pretty special in believe out. What do, you, what do you do for kids? I teach art. Um, I've been teaching, man. yeah. I've been teaching for about seven years. I've been teaching Hoboken, Jersey City, anywhere, anywhere to take me. I volunteer too. Um, my well, brother. What have you been doing with your brother? Recently, two days ago, <laughs> my brother Matthew Ramos. He's uh, police uh, in charge of um, community relations. Here in Jersey City? Yeah, mm-hmm. He came on a year. He's, he's actually me. right up the street. North, yeah, so yeah, a little close. So what we did was it was National Reading Day. So I used to get dressed up as Batman for cons and art shows and birthday parties. So I had the, the, the costume packed away and, you know, collecting dust. And one day he tells me, he goes, Eli, you know, I'm going to go read to the kids. I'm like, you want to don the suit? I'm like, do I? You know? <laughs> so... We had a good time. I, from from 9 a.m. to 3 3 p.m., we were running around and taking pictures, and it was really fun watching the little kids' eyes light up. And from anywhere from kindergarten to I think the highest we went was fifth grade, and it's 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 nice. Like I said, I I, I love showing kindness and love through our actions. I believe as as people, that's what we're here for: is to show each other kindness, encourage one another. I'm not going to get preachy, but that was what I was always taught. You know, my, my mom and dad always taught me, dad's a preacher, so always taught me to encourage one another, uplift one another. You could ask her, I don't, I'm one of the few, don't talk ill will about anyone. <laughs> I'll play a little bit, but I'm one of those people. That's that, my favorite, when you start playing. Them, yeah, when she sees, when, once in a while, when, when she sees me joking around, she's like, oh, this is a new Eli, but, you know. I, that's, I, no, that's my I favorite never, Eli. That's my favorite never, Eli. <laughs> never anything but malice, but, uh, you know, I know here, no one has malice, but I try to, you know, to help people, no. especially kids, because that's, that's, that's our forefront. That's where, that's where our generation is going to come up. And as us being older and older people passing on and us in the middle, you know, it's important to kind of show them that life isn't always anger and pain and frustration and because stepping we, on and one another. And that's the thing, though. We see people at their worst moments. Yes. Like, yes. when somebody picks up the phone, phone and dials 911, whether it be a water leak, a gas emergency or you know what there are home alarms going off to them that's their Everything. worst moment in their whole life yeah let alone fires let alone what you know let alone fires let alone car accidents all that mm -hmm. so to be able to go there be professional have that attitude you know we could play as much as we want in the firehouse but the second that those lights go on and that front that bay opens up it's just totally different you know what i mean you it's have to and and you are you're there to you're there to f help them fix their problems and make sure they're okay because that's what we're here and to make sure that we 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 also yeah. come home. It's you funny know? she mentions that. I think the hardest part of the job is when you get to a fire. You obviously lost a life. You know that's number one. And I could go into some stories, but um, those are the ones that make you call your kids and tell them you love them and. You know, I mean, you're always there for them and things like that. I mean, the first hard call I had was a 12-year-old girl killed herself, you know. And I remember at the time my niece, who I helped raise, she was 12. 
So the first thing I did was call her and tell her I'm there and all that. But um, when it comes to like the, the buildings, you know, watching, you know, like, like everyone lose everything, it's kind of hard. Like once you get it done and you, you protect the exposures, but watching the people, having them, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. And that brings it back to how important the firehouse kitchen table is. As a firefighter myself, I know I've been through so many difficult calls myself. Yeah. And I find that when you go back to that kitchen and you sit down and we all talk about it and we discuss it, and instead of shutting down and going somewhere and being off to yourself, because that's never good. No. Mm -hmm. So being in that kitchen, tell me what that means to you, that firehouse kitchen. It's, depending on who's there, it's, you know, certain people can definitely, even me, I'm part of the crisis team. Oh, great, talk about that a little bit. Um, pretty much what I learned that you have to have an open ear, talk, talk less, <laughs> listen more, that's important because everyone's perception is always different, how people see things. To one person, a call might be the end of the world, to someone else it may not be, you know, be hard for them. Everyone deals different. Everyone, and then depending on trauma, past, and you, you deal with, you see what, what types of things, demons people are fighting. And what we do is, you know, we're, we're like, you know, here to, to just talk. They don't have to say who they are, nothing like that. The number they call, and we help them out. And uh, you know, it's 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 nice to it's nice to be there because sometimes you just need to talk. Even sometimes in our brain, we know what we should be doing or how we should be thinking. But it's nice to have that little enforcement. So sometimes you'll have someone at the the kitchen that would be, you know, me and her talk a lot too. You know what I mean? Like kind of encourage one another and kind of yeah. like when someone's kind of having a bad day, you can tell. Like, what's wrong? What's going on? And that's because, you know, and that's the big thing. We spend, you know, this is, this really is, I mean, this is, this is your, you're just your home away from home. Yeah. I mean, you're with these guys 24 hours a day. We eat together. We sleep together. We fight fire together. Yeah. We, we see each other in such a different light that, you know what, you know instantly. And you also know when, you know what, let me give them a minute versus when it's like, well, I don't, I don't care if you want to talk or not, we're talking. Because you need to, you know what I mean? You know no, what I'm talking about. No, you have to. Yeah. Because you have to. You have to. Let it out. And that's the thing, you know what? I think this job is so different than so many other jobs because you really do, you just know each other inside and out. In, in this job, you absolutely depend on each other. Oh, yeah. You know, from the minute you step off that rig, yeah. you, have, you have to be with each other. So that's yeah. a completely different dynamic than most yeah. other professions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so that, the bond you're talking about is so significant. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, you know what, like, and even for us, like our crew now, you know what, our captain, you know, he has all of us in his hands at all times. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we also have each other, too, in, in, in protecting too. him, too. So yeah. it's, such a, it's such a large responsibility on every aspect. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot. When you really think about it, you know what I mean? But It's family. It's We're family. Guys. And on, I mean, truthfully, I mean, I never, like, for me, especially going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know what? I never drove anything over the size of a pickup truck. Me neither. And then I can't, and neither, you didn't even have, what? You didn't even have a license before you got. I did. Like, right before the job, though, close I, to it, right? I had a license when I was 20. I was working yeah. at the airport. Yeah. I was so, driving, like, tugs and those yeah. big nothing this big. Right? Yeah, so, but exactly. So, you know what I mean? We were out there, I mean, every tour for hours and hours yeah. and hours. But I was fortunate, I had senior guys that were willing to be out there for hours with me. As long as you're willing, I mean, especially on this job, especially for Jersey City, if you're willing to learn and you're not alone and you're not just sitting there, they're gonna train you and they're gonna train you hard and they're gonna push teach. you, you know always. what I mean? And that's the thing I love the most about, not only just being a firefighter, but like being in this house in, the, in Jersey City, you know? These guys, if you're real, they're gonna be real right back, and they're gonna get you back. Yeah, yeah. TGC, right? So it's just yeah. a great place to work. Oh uh, yeah. What what advice would you have for someone looking to become a firefighter? What would you say? Better apply to Jersey City. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, honestly, I would I would tell them that you know what, you have to be mentally tough, you have to be physically fit, and above all, if you're serious and this is really what you think that you want to do, then put. It everything you have into it and you're every because everything that you put into it you're gonna get back out because the guys are gonna know that and um, you know what I mean and especially for Jersey City you know this is everybody's so real so it's uh if you're gonna if you're gonna do it do it 100% that that's my best advice I give you if you're gonna do this don't half-ass it just 
Do it 100%. 100% focused. 100% focused. And then the reward is here. Again, right? it's Just being a part of this just is, being here. Is, is the reward. Yeah. Right. Being with chief, my chief, being with my captains, being with my guys, formulating those lifelong friendships. And then, and then also, if, that, if that's not positive enough, actually helping somebody or saving somebody's life. Well, first I'll say I'm no hero. I just do what I can. Um, so I would say if you have the heart to help people, because everything else comes, you know, it comes with it. If you're passionate about something, you can't fake having a heart. Yeah, <laughs> it, it happens. Like even being an artist, it's, it's easy. It's it's natural. Doing this, there's a lot to learn. I I probably would, would retire and still have things that I could have learned, different ways to do things and all that. But if if you have the heart to learn and you have the heart to help people, and, and the you, willingness, yeah, the willingness. and you want to put that work in, it's it's worth it. You know, I would say that to any job where you help anyone, just, you know, and that's, like you said, that's, that's what this world needs. It needs people to be like, you know what, it's more than just me. So I would tell them if you're looking for a job that you believe is bigger than yourself and you want to help your fellow man and woman and, you know, and once in a while even doggy, cat, you know, right. save a couple yeah. animals oh, here and there. Yeah, I forgot about <laughs> <Squirrel>. that fire. <laughs> you know, if you, if you, if oh, you really squirrel. have that, if you really have yeah. that want. Yeah. And didn't do it. It's it was worth it. It's you know? so worth it. And you'll meet people just like yourself that will encourage and you. And that's right the here. thing too, though. You know, what? we're because we're all little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little. And then you you just you migrate to certain yeah. like you just you find people that have the same screws loose. You know what I mean? <laughs> you kind of fit each other. Yeah, screws. you just what, not, yeah, perfect. What I, like, what I like to say <laughs> is, you no, know, it's funny. We, we all have the same core values. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we we just migrate to each other. Yeah. <laughs> And we're back with the Deputy Chief Drennan here at the tour commander's house, which is an awesome place. They just uh, showed me the inside lobby, which you're going to see on the show. Amazing tribute to the firefighters that have fallen here in Jersey City. So Chief, tell me what this is all about. Here. Okay, this is the command board for the city for 24 hours. Okay, for every day. There's four groups, A, B, C, and D. Uh, this is our group today. This is B Okay. with our four battalions. Then tomorrow will be C. Then D and A, and it's like a clock, and then it starts over again back to B. Right, so just okay. start, rotate just like that. Just like that. Gotcha. So and so now we're in B group today, which okay. is which I'm the tour commander of, and we are broken down into four geographical parts of the city: Battalion One, Battalion Two, Battalion Three, and Battalion Four. Each battalion has about six to seven companies under their command, and our job here is to do the manpower to make sure that all the companies are balanced. There's guys that are off for sick leave, they're on vacation time, they have personal time off. And then, so who's ever off and it changes constantly, like in the morning we'll get sick leave tickets, who's on sick leave, who's out because somebody died in their family, they're on funeral leave. And then we gotta balance the manpower, balance it out, we may need to call in overtime, and we gotta do what we gotta do to make sure that we have the minimal amount of manpower on each rig for the day. This is a big undertaking. It's, it's a daunting task and it, it really constantly is. changes. Yeah. And then as the day's going on, besides taking in runs and going on our calls, going to incidents, we got to manage for the night tour because it changes at night and this will be switching up. We got to make sure the people that are on the rigs, that the captains, the first level officers, know who's on their rigs and what radios they have for accountability purposes in case there's an incident and something goes wrong. So you're, you're literally a man behind the curtain. S sort of, sort of <laughs> man behind the curtain. Yeah, this is then, a lot. And, and also, as the day's going on, and we're getting the, the day tour straightened out and the night tour straightened out, we got to start taking care of the next tour. So as that's going on by 8 p.m., our, our, our manpower will be done for the next tour. Wow. This is so, a, yeah, so, yeah. Guy, so guys booking out sick and vacation days and yep. bereavement days. I mean, you know, like you said, firefighters getting injured. Yep. That's, that all falls in, into, the, into this. It's a, like you said, right. it's a great word, daunting. This yep. is a daunting task. So tell me a little bit about yourself, Chief. You, uh, how long have you been here in Jersey City? Okay, um, I just started my 25th year. Oh, good for you. And I've been a 
deputy chief for about three years. It'll be three years in, in June. Tell me what that's like being a deputy chief here. Because you have some family well, history, right? Yeah, you know, well, my whole family. Uh, I was the fifth brother in, in my immediate family. Wow. My father and his four brothers were, were firefighters, too. Oh, great. Officers. So, all uh, here in Jersey City? All Jersey City, wow. yes. That's great. So, yeah, I think there was about 18 of us working at one at one point. Holy so, cow. Yeah, so it was a lot. So I know you're not familiar with my, my show, but my show is big on tradition, big on family and firefighting. And, and that's great. That's a huge amount of people in your family. Yeah. That's great. So you're part of a culture. This is awesome. Yeah. You know, when I first got on a job, I didn't like that because I wanted to be my own person. Right. But as time went by, I really learned to embrace it now. And I do. You know, I appreciate it. Yeah, if absolutely. it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have wanted to be a firefighter all, also. Right, so, yeah. That's, so it definitely that's inspired me. That's great. Yeah. So uh, outside of doing this, and I, I think it's important for our viewers to know that not only the, this in itself to me is just a full-time job. When I look at this... This alone, I'm like, because I know how it is. I have to manage, you know, 25 people. I take a look at this, and it's overwhelming. So, uh, and again, this is a full-time job, in my opinion. So, on top of that, explain to my viewers. On top of that, you're also doing, you're know, taking in runs, right? Yeah. You're, so, you know, like you said, you know, every rank that I've been in, you know, I, I've always felt responsibility. But since I became a deputy chief tour commander, and now I really don't go inside anymore. I'm totally outside. Correct. That I feel the responsibility of everybody's lives in my hands. And I've never felt that much responsibility until I had this position. Absolutely. Because I always felt like I'm going in with my, my, my members. I'm inside. I could see things. If something goes wrong, I felt like at least I'm in here with them. But being outside, I feel like I don't ever want to make a mistake being outside. So there is, you know, so uh, an extreme amount of pressure on, on other people's lives when I'm standing outside. The and it's interesting you say that because there's sometimes, you know, we, we talk to young firefighters that are, you know, you know, you're doing that evacuation tone. You, everybody's getting out, yeah. right? And they're like, what are you doing right here? I'm at the seat. I'm at the seat. I'm here. I'm here. But they're not seeing what you're seeing. They're not seeing what I'm seeing. Right? I've had that happen a few times already. And just recently, even inside, I had, you know, great battalion chiefs telling me, you know, we got it. It's knocked down. And then I just said, okay, uh, evacuate the building. I told them to still get out of the building. Because they're not seeing the other building that's about to fall on top of them. Correct. Yeah, their building was out. But the building next to them was, was in big trouble of collapse. So, uh, so I pulled them out, and then they come out, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you know that was a good call." But even if I make the wrong call, you know, I tell my I tell my people, I tell my officers to tell their, to tell their men that if I make the wrong call, you still get out. So what? You could say whatever you want about me. But you're going home. I've seen something. You're going to go home that day. And that's the most you know? important thing. You know, Absolutely. we did our job. We're in there. We're doing searches. You know, it's the risk versus reward. Absolutely. You know, I don't want. You're not going to get your life risk for no reason. At sure. All. You know. I'm yeah. Pull you out. And, it, and how, how important is it for you to have, I mean, you have the, the backbone, like you have all these firefighters that are depending on you. How different was it for you to step into the role as a tour commander or deputy chief? And like you said, you're no longer inside here with the men and the members. Was that hard for you? Uh, you know, I, I got to say, it was an adjustment, but it wasn't hard because it's something I really wanted to do. I wanted to take on a responsibility and, I, you know, I love the job. Yeah, the and uh, so, so I was definitely, definitely ready to make the move. Right. You know, every, every, every move I made was always an adjustment. Absolutely. But, uh, and this is a big responsibility. Yeah. Well, Chief, listen, I appreciate very much you showing me, uh, showing me what you do here. And this is just, again, a small part of what you do here. Yes. But it's such a tremendous, uh, tremendous responsibility. Yes. Right? Yep. It's pretty cool. What, of all the houses that you've been in, um, <clears throat> which one was most memorable? Well, this one right here. Engine 22. Engine 22. Yep, even on this group, too, because I worked on this group as a captain at a... I was a firefighter on another group, but I was a captain on this group with, with great guys, great members. That's another thing. Right. You know, I feel very blessed because my battalion chiefs, you can see you got Richie Gorman here, oh, Stevie, Richie, yeah, Stevie Drennan, Sean Verdi, and, and Bill Rawley. The best uh, battalion chief that got, got the group. And I also got Tom Conforti as my, my field training officer. He's sort right. of like the safety officer and the training yeah. officer. Of that the name group. is synonymous with training. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, got, uh, I got great battalion chiefs that make my job easy because they're, they're experienced. I looked up to them. They are all older than me, you know, and they were on a job longer than me, every one of them. So I just feel blessed I got them and I got their experience. Uh, yeah. You can't put a price them. tag on that kind of I can't knowledge put, and experience. No, I can't. No, I can't. That's, that's Especially great. Especially when you're at incidents and people's lives are on the line and our lives are on the line. Absolutely. You know? Chief, thank you very much yeah. for talking. My pleasure, man. Anytime. There you go. Deputy Chief right here for Pin the Q podcast.
cocaine officer decided to be responding to reported fire at 202 South near Kennedy as a form of shooting. regular first due unit was with me so there was a high probability that I was going to be first due. Turns out engine 15 got there but on our approach we witnessed at least three radio cars from the police department enter the block. Now the police they have a, a definitive role they must have gotten a hot call they must have had a reason to go in there and um, now I have concerns about apparatus placement, traffic congestion, and them wanting to go into the building uh, unprotected to possibly make rescues. And then that just complicates my job that much further. And uh, again, my, my responsibility is, you know, for the safety of my guys, the residents of the people who are, who are living there, and, and then the cops. We Everybody has to go home. We have to make sure that nobody's getting, getting hurt. And it's all preventable. Um, it happens, but as you saw, the, the police, they, they do a good job, they understand that the, the fire department is coming and they know that their radio cars don't have any fire suppression equipment and they dump their cars to allow us to get in there as, as quickly as we can. And then, then they kind of move out of our way. Um, our relationship in Jersey City with the police department is, is second to none. They are a great group of professionals. We work well with them every single day. We have deep respect for them as they do for us. And you know, we, we try not to do anything to damage that. The one thing I'll, I'll mention to you, Chief, is that upon arrival, there were so many things in motion. And what I liked was just what you said. The radio cars were out of the way. The, the officers were dumping off into driveways. They were dumping off into the side streets to make room for the killer is right behind us and uh, everyone just knew exactly what their role was as soon as they got off the rig and obviously that has a lot to do with the training absolutely absolutely yeah um and they um it wasn't a it wasn't a fire on this was a fire reported you saw the urgency in the guys the way you know the first two engine company is specifically going to go in they're going to locate the seat of a fire if anything they're going to do that interior investigation and they're gonna give me a report right away they know that we're waiting on that they know we have you know 42 guys in multiple apparatus responding into this and so we, we want that you know is this a fire or not and then if it would have been you would have seen some some real good engine work real aggressive firefighting from this city thanks chief All right. so chief what are we going to we are responding to two Hague Street for a residential automatic fire alarm in a multi-story seniors complex. It's probably a, a malfunction since the, it's not the central alarm going off. It seems to be localized to in the But we'll wait to see what the engine has to say when they arrive. Engine is on the scene now, establishing command, and they're going to continue to investigate. Um, they'll arrive at the same time as Ladder 7. Uh, 
Engine 14 is reporting a report of unattended clipping, which is very common up here. In this case, what you'll see when we arrive is you'll see the ladder is where it's supposed to be in front of the building. The engine, first two engines in front of that, the second two engine is going to come in and feed the first two engine. This is critical because now if this turns out to be something or if there was subsequent information that uh, supported a working fire or reported smoke where we had to go to four engines, two ladders and a full response, well then that second ladder would come up behind the first ladder and then the other two engines would be in the, uh, in the back area, a primary and, in a, and, a, and a feed pumper. So, poultry motion. Uh, what we had at 2 Hague Street in the apartment was unattended cooking, which is uh, burnt food on the stove. Um, very common call up here, especially with the uh, senior citizens complex. Um, the use of um, a skillet or even a microphone. There was no fire, just uh, just the smoke. They called for the alarm to be silenced. They ventilated the apartment. Ladder 7 assisted with a, an alarm reset and we were good to go. Nice. All right, um, this is what we're gonna do. I, I read an article in Fire Engineering a, a couple of tours ago, and it was named Radio Messaging Under Warlike Conditions. And um, it was good. Now, as we went through it, we started to see that we have a young group of firefighters here, and radio communications, as bad as they are in the heights, we really haven't experienced a lot of fires of late, and that garbled type of messaging that you get from um, radios, on the portable radios with background noise and everything, and you're not hearing what's going on, this is going to prove that. So what we're going to do is uh, um, Evolution 1, Ladder 3 is going to go out, you're going to start a couple of saws, and you're going to, you want to introduce the Scott Pack, Ryan? Um, you want to do it at first, or you want to? We're, we're going to do two evolutions. We're going to okay. start the saw up with uh, two saws up, and he's going to give a radio report. And he's going to be facing the saws just like he would on the roof. He's going to be watching the command to ladder three, what you got, and he's going to be looking at what's going on. And all that ambient background noise is going to come right into his speaker mic. You're going to hear it, and then what we're going to do in that next evolution, we're going to introduce more stress, more noise, and then he's going to turn his head his body or shield his mic from that noise and then he's going to slow his rate of speech down he's going to speak you know clearer slower pronunciate his words better and you're going to see a definitive difference between um, his first transmission and his second and the takeaway from this is that when you're under all of that stress you have to remember that I if I can't hear you and I have to ask you to repeat your message we just wasted a couple, a lot of time. You know, in the incipient stage of a fire, that's a lot of time. You don't want to do that. Um, the second evolution is going to be with an engine company, and um, Marty, if you're okay with it, that's fine. We're going to do the same, a similar exercise, but we're going to use the Scott mask. So you're going to Scott up, you're going to put the mask on, you're going to be breathing air, and you're going to be using the voice ports for the enunciators on the side of your mask. Same thing. Initially, I want you to be very hurried, very quick. Um, give your message as in, you know, we're, we're stretching the line down the hallway of a building. I can see fire at the end of the hallway. Charge the line. Fire darkening down. You start to use terminology that you would use, that I would, that would be helpful to me, you know, primary searches, whatever. 
and then the second evolution will be you're going to slow it down a little bit more. Now, initially, I want you to keep the speaker mic right up next to the man. And it's not, it, it may not be as clear as if you had it maybe a couple inches away. So that's what we're going to evaluate. Same, same takeaway. The second time around, you're going to speak clearer, pronunciate your words, and slower. And the, and the idea is that I don't have to listen. I don't have to ask you again the second time for what you said. We'll, get, we'll try to get it right the first time. And the more we do that, and when we have a fire...